So today we are very happy to have Ode Genève speaking on learning with entropy regularized optimal transport. Ode is currently a postdoc at MIT working on optimal transport for machine learning in the GDP group of Justin Solomon. She obtained her PhD at École Normale Supérieure and University of Paris Dauphine under Gabriel Perret in 2019. And she'll be discussing OT. I'll let you go ahead, Ode, please. Thank you, Adam, for uh, the introduction and the invitation. I'm really uh, happy to um, get to present my work at your uh, Montreal seminar. Um, and so I'm going to, I guess, present my uh, PhD work that I did, uh, as you said, under the, the direction of Gabriel Perret. Uh, but this is also joint work with Marco Couturi, Francis Bach, and Vinay Chiza, who are all uh, back in Paris. Um, and I'll, I'll um, explain how we can use entropy regularized transport in a variety of uh, learning settings. Um, and so the motivation for studying entropy regularized optimal transport from, comes from the need to compare probability measures, um, which can either be continuous, discrete, or a mix of both. And this is um, a key component of many um, machine learning applications. Um, for instance, if you consider a discrete setting, um, you may have like a very large um, point cloud here represented in uh, in orange um, that you want to summarize by a smaller number of points. So this is um, often called quantization problem. Um, and so to solve this problem, you want to minimize some notion of distance between the blue uh, point cloud, who, whose parameters are the positions of the points um, x1, xk. You want to minimize the notion between uh, the some notion of distance between this blue point cloud and the orange point cloud, with, which represents your data. And so you're going to want to, um, for instance, do gradient descent to minimize the distance until you find um, some, some position of the blue points that um, best represent this, this larger point cloud. Um, another motivation, which here is a semi-discrete setting, is uh, density fitting. So again, you have this um, large um, point cloud, which represents your, your data, and you want to learn some parametric model um, alpha theta that is going to best um, fit your data set. And again, you want to minimize some uh, notion of distance between uh, your data here and your parametric model alpha theta. And so you're going to want to do some gradient descent to get the optimal parameter theta star that best explains um, your, uh, your data. And so in, in both examples, you can see that you want to minimize some notion of distance between probability measures. So in the case of quantization, it's uh, discrete measures that represent point clouds. Um, in the case of density fitting, it's one, one the continuous measure and, and a discrete one. But the key notion here is how to measure the notion of closeness between measures. Um, and for that, we need to, um, to, to choose a, a meaningful notion of distance. So probably the most widely used uh, uh, one are um, phi divergences that were introduced by Caesar in the 60s. And for that, um, so to compare two measures alpha and beta, you need to choose some um, convex function phi, and uh, you're going to compare the, um, your, your two um, measures by looking at their ratio uh, through that function phi. Um, and this, this um, will give you some, some notion of distance between these two measures. The most common example is the callback Leibler divergence, which is simply using phi um, to be x log x. Um, but you can see that it's not a very good notion of distance for several reasons. The first one being that when alpha and beta um, don't have the same support, um, this thing is um, going to blow up. And so it's not well defined um, for uh, things that do not have uh, a density, for instance. Um, so here is a, a simple example in which the KL divergence really fails to capture uh, the, the geometry of the problem. Um, you consider here uh, a, a Dirac in zero, here in blue, which we'll call alpha, and here um, Dirac in one over n, which so a sequence of Dirac's um, located at one over n. Um, so here at n equals one, um, you have the KL between um, alpha n and alpha that is equal to plus infinity because they have uh, disjoint support. When n increases, you can see intuitively that these two things are, these two directs are getting closer. But in the sense of the KL divergence, it's always going to be equal to plus infinity. So you get no signal from this distance that tells you whether you're getting closer or further from your, from your um, target um, limit here alpha. And the, the formal notion, formal mathematical notion between, behind that um, intuition is uh, weak convergence. 
And so we say that um, some sequence alpha n weakly converges to um, a limit alpha if the integral of any continuous bounded function f against um, alpha n converges to the integral of that same function against the limit alpha. Um, and so to have a meaningful notion of distance in these minimization problems, we want some distance that metrizes weak convergence, which means that converging in the sense of that distance is equivalent to weakly converging. And so it's obviously not the case for the KL divergence, because um, a Dirac in 1 over n weakly converges to a Dirac in 0, um, but the KL divergence is not uh, converging to, to 0 as n goes to infinity. So that's why we need to introduce uh, alternative notions of distance to uh, capture that phenomenon. And for that, an alternative or integral probability metrics, um, as introduced by, uh, by Mueller. And um, so to compare two uh, measures alpha and beta, you need to choose a class of functions f, a uh, class of uh, test functions. And then you're going to look at the expectation of that test, uh, test function under alpha and under beta. You're going to look at the gap. And you're going to look at the maximal gap um, over all possible test functions in your class. And depending on the richness of your class, um, it may or may not um, metrize weak convergence. And there are some um, very well-known examples. For instance, total, the total variation distance um, corresponds to an IPM with where f is the set of uh, functions upper bounded by 1. So this one does not metrize weak convergence. Um, but if you consider the set of uh, one Lipschitz functions, which corresponds to the Wasserstein distance, this does metrize weak convergence. And similarly, if you consider um, maximum mean discrepancies, um, which corresponds to uh, the sets of functions bounded by one in uh, a given RKHS, this also is something that metrizes um, weak convergence. And we'll be um, focusing more on the Wasserstein distance and MMD in the, in the next few slides. Um, so maximum mean discrepancies were introduced by uh, Breton fairly uh, recently, and they require to understand the notion of uh, reproducing coronal Hilbert space. So, can, can I slow you down for one second? Can you go back to the last slide? Yeah. So it's an interesting just to understand the definition of an integral probability metric. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it looks a little bit like your, you know, like an empirical loss over f and f, right? Mm-hmm. Roughly speaking, can you just say a little more about the definition? Right. So you so the idea is to test so to to test the difference in mean of your uh, two measures. Yeah. For some some given uh, function, and then you you look at the worst um, possible gap that can happen on on this class of function. And if you have a class of function that is a uh, uh, rich enough, yeah. Um, then it it's this uh, this is sufficient to uh, to ensure that you metrize weak convergence. Um, so I forgot the exact um, technical criteria that you um, that you need here for for f to for but, the f to metrize weak convergence. But and does it look a little bit like the Wasserstein GAN definition there? Oh um, yeah. So when you um, when you replace f by the set of one Lipschitz functions, it's exactly the um, like the Rubinstein uh, Kantorovich duality. So the dual of the one Wasserstein distance, and that's exactly what they use in Wasserstein GANs. Okay. Cool. Yeah. So it's a loss you can actually. That's actually something people train on for one. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Cool. Exactly. Thank you. Right. Um, and so right now I'm just going to focus on uh, on MMD, which is another instance of maximum mean discrepancies, um, for which the the set of test functions um, is the set of uh, functions bounded by one in the RKHS. Um, and so RKHS are Hilbert spaces that are endowed with some kernel function k, um, which is a positive definite function um, that belongs to your RKHS. But also, uh, more importantly, to, you could, to have a function f to belong to that uh, RKHS um, means that all your um, functions can be decomposed as the scalar product of some representer f uh, against that kernel function k. And so this, this allows to, um, to, have, to simplify a lot of, uh, of computations when you're dealing with functions in that RKHS. And here it's the case uh, for the definition of MMD. So here it's the uh, definition of integral probability metric that I um, that was on the previous slide, and we restri restrict ourselves to the functions that are um, bounded by one in that RKHS in, in the RKHS norm. Um, 
and using this decomposition of, of f as the scalar product between um, the representer and uh, the kernel product, we can prove that the maximum um, is attained actually for f, which is equal to the kernel function. Um, and this gives um, this gives a closed form solution for the optimum, which is simply the sum of three um, expectations over product measures. So you can see that you have some uh, fairly abstract definition here, but thanks to this uh, kernel formulation, you can actually write it very simply. And um, if you assume that you have samples from alpha and beta, well, you can just replace these empirical, um, expect sorry, these uh, expectations here by empirical expectations. And so it's just going to become double sums. And so you can estimate um, MMD if you have samples of size N, you can estimate uh, MMD in uh, O of N squared. So it's a pretty cheap um, approximation. It's, it's uh, easy to compute. Um, on the other hand, you also have um, optimal transport, which is um, another type of distance which metrizes weak convergence. And so it's um, an old problem that dates back, back to the 18th uh, century and was introduced by Munch. Um, and for that, you first need to fix some uh, cost function that tells you how, how much it costs you to move a unit of mass um, from a point X in your first measure to a point Y in your second measure. Um, and then you're going to look for the optimal coupling that tells you um, how much mass you move from a point X in your first measure to a point Y in your second measure. So here's a, a maybe more visual way of understanding the problem. So you have a first um, measure alpha here in the discrete setting. So it's a, a sum of Dirac, and here your second measure beta. And in the discrete case, your coupling uh, function is actually just going to be a, a matrix that tells you, well, if you take a point, for instance, this Dirac, how does it split? Um, and how is it sent to uh, the direct in the other uh, distribution? So it, it gives you a, a correspondence between the two measures, but it also uh, gives you a notion of distance between these two measures. And the associated notion of distance is known as the Wasserstein distance. And it tells you the, it corresponds to the minimal cost of moving all the mass from alpha to beta according to these um, couplings. And so formally it's defined uh, as follows. So you're looking for the minimum over all couplings with marginals alpha and beta. Uh, so the minimal total cost of moving the mass according to this transfer plan pi. Um, and so keep in mind that this is a constrained problem because here your uh, couplings need to have marginals alpha and beta. And when you consider your uh, cost here, your cost of moving, of moving mass from x to y to be the Euclidean distance or some power of the Euclidean distance, this is what we call the P-Wasserstein distance and it's um, an actual distance, it satisfies all the, the axioms of a distance. Okay, so what are the pros and the cons of optimal transport versus MMD? Um, the first thing we can consider is the sample complexity. So um, I'll get back to sample complexity a bit later in, in the talk, but intuitively it tells you um, how well you can estimate the distance between measures by just computing the, the distance from samples of these measures. So it gives you the convergence rate of the empirical uh, MMD to MMD or the convergence rate of the to, uh, empirical OT to OT. Um, and in the case of MMD, that convergence rate is one over square root of n, so it's independent of dimension. But in the case of optimal transport, um, it's n to the minus uh, one over d, so you have a curse of dimension, meaning that um, as dimension grows, you need, you need more and more samples uh, to get a, a quality approximation of optimal transport. Um, so that's for the statistical aspects of the distances and then for the computational aspect. Um, so as I mentioned, M MMD uh, is computable in, in O of N square because it amounts to computing um, empirical expectations uh, over product measures. But for optimal transport, it's a constrained optimal optimization problem uh, and you, it requires to solve a linear program which um, scales as N cube uh, log N. So from both uh, standpoints, it seems that MI, MMD would be the smart choice. Um, so the, the right notion of distance to use because it's more convenient and it's more robust to statistical um, sampling. But then um, we're gonna see how, how both uh, compare on an actual simple learning problem. So here is the quantization problem that I mentioned in the introduction, um, except we have um, a similar number of points in the, in the blue point cloud and the, the yellow point cloud. So we just want to see um, how well each notion of distance is going to, uh, um, to perform when we're trying to minimize the distance between the blue point cloud and the, 
orange point cloud by moving the, um, the support of these points here. So when the notion of distance that we use is MMD with a Gaussian kernel, um, you can see it's pretty bad. Um, it doesn't really recover the, the geometry of the problem. Um, so of course, the, the choice of the kernel function in, in MMD is crucial because it's going to um, affect the behavior of your notion of distance. There are better uh, suited uh, kernels. Uh, for instance, the, MMD, uh, the energy distance, um, which I'll introduce later on, uh, works fairly well in these settings, but you still have some points that are um, lagging behind and not really where you would like them to be. Um, on the other hand, if you do the same thing for optimal transport, um, it's very efficient. And actually, the, the, the trajectory of the gradient descent follows the uh, mapping from optimal transport. So if you uh, try to map the initial, if you look at the initial um, positions, if you try to map this blue point cloud to this orange point cloud uh, using the coupling, the coupling will tell you straight, will give you straight lines on how to match points, and that's the path that the uh, optimal transport is following. So it's very, uh, it has very efficient gradients. Um, here's a more complicated example um, where we have um, a more complex um, geometry, I guess. Um, and you can right. see. Can I interrupt for one sec? We had uh, a question. Can you go back to the first example? And I think Giannis has a question. I had a question as well. <clears throat> Uh, yeah, I, mean, I, have a, I have a question. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, so I'm uh, I'm basically trying to understand how the two uh, the two different slides, uh, you know, what's the compromise between the two? Uh, you did mention that computationally, uh, optimal transport is more expensive, mm -hmm. um, right? And also in terms of the sample complexity, uh, but you're also showing us some examples where. Uh, optimal transport seems to be working better. Mm -hmm. So is it because what we see here is, for example, worst case analysis, but in practice, optimal transport is and uh, does a better job in some cases? Um, no, so the, um, the curse of dimension is, is uh, present for a wide range of measures and we observe it uh, even on very simple examples. And the computational cost, um, I guess, is worse case. Um, in practice, it's slightly. It seems it so it behaves slightly better than a cubic for a for a lot of problems, but it's still um, prohibitive. So it's still um, fairly inconvenient to use transport as is in um, in machine learning problems, and that brings me actually to the um, um, next part, which is uh, we're going to use entropic rigorization um, to improve the the sample complexity and the computational cost of optimal transport. Um, yeah, does that answer your question? Okay. Um, mostly, I guess uh, just one quick follow up and then that's mm -hmm. it for me. Is there something special about that problem that you showed us with the point clouds where optimal transport seems to be doing better? What 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 is the main takeaway? Um, oh, so I guess the main, the main takeaway is that the gradients for optimal transport are better. Um, if you, so if, if you, do the math, basically, you can see that the gradients tend to vanish when you use MMD. Um, so for instance, with the Gaussian kernel uh, here, the gradients vanish pretty quickly. So if the points are, so if you don't initialize very close um, to the um, to the optimum, um, the points just get to random places and then they can't move uh, because the gradients are not strong enough to pull them back to the, um, to the right position. Um, and for MMD, we observe kind of a, a similar behaviors. The, the gradients are very small. You can see like when the points are far, the gradients are very small and they take a very long time. Um, it, like if I ran it long enough, um, it would go back, but it takes like a, probably a thousand gradient iterations to get these blue points to go back here. While for optimal transport, it just takes like some th something around 15 iterations to get almost a perfect matching. So. Thank you. Okay, so uh, am I, what, So the last question is, we see a nice geometric picture, and I think the takeaway is that OT captures what we're looking for a little bit better. Mm -hmm. um, and the challenge you're trying to face is how do you leverage a computational method that's comparable to MMD? Exactly, yeah. Um, right, and here was another example where MMD performs even worse because it completely overshoots the gradients. 
um, and then the points have really a hard time getting back to um, where they should be. And again, OT is really efficient at matching the points right away because it follows um, a straight line and follows the, the optimal coupling in a, in a straight line. So it's moving here, it's just a scaling issue from Python. Um, sorry about that. Um, but so you, you, you covered the, the three main things in machine learning. You've got the data, the modeling, the statistical learning, and the optimization. They're all interacting in this problem. Mm -hmm. Exactly, yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so this is essentially a toy problem, but that really tells you, gives you, really gives you an intuition of how the different distances are behaving, I guess. Um, and so now the, the main goal is to be able to still use optimal transport for its good geometric properties, but um, try to get the sample complexity and computational complexity on par with MMD so that it can, so that it can be uh, used for um, high dimensional problems that always arise in machine learning. And so the, the key here is going to be the entropy categorization um, that was introduced at least to the machine learning community by um, Marco Couturi in 2013. Um, and for that, so you take your um, classic definition of the Wasserstein distance with some cost function C, and you add here an entropy regularization. So here epsilon is going to be the strength of your uh, regularization. And you um, penalize by the relative entropy of the transport plan pi with respect to the product measure of your uh, marginals alpha and beta. Um, so what does it do in, in practice, this entropy regularization? Well, if, if you remember the, the picture from the coupling that I showed you earlier in the discrete case. So here's a continuous version, but you assume that you have here one of the um, marginals here and the other marginal here. And so your uh, coupling here just tells you um, how mass is sent from one marginal to the other. Um, and when epsilon increases, so here's for a small value of epsilon, so we're close to true optimal transport, you can see you still have a pretty sharp matching between the two distributions. But when you um, add the regularization parameter, the matching becomes more um, fuzzy. Instead of matching one point with exactly one point, you're matching one point with like a, a small region of the other distribution. Um, so that's the effect of entropy, but why uh, do we actually want to do this? Because we're getting something that is um, less precise. Well, the main reason is that we get a nice dual problem. Um, here, we're looking at the standard, um, at the jewel of the standard optimal transport problem. So we went from minimizing over the space of couplings with marginals alpha and beta to maximizing over continuous functions. Um, so here the function u corresponds to the constraint that the coupling has marginal alpha and the function v corresponds to the other constraint that the coupling has marginal beta. Um, and so you're, you're having this maximization problem over a space of continuous functions, and you have the constraint that the sum of these two functions is smaller than your cost function C. Um, so looking at the dual, we haven't really improved our, uh, our issue because we were just, uh, um, we still have a constrained, uh, constrained optimization problem to solve. But when we consider the dual of the regularized optimal transport, instead of having this hard constraint here that the sum of the um, to uh, dual potentials is smaller than C, we have an exponential um, penalty on that constraint. And so now we have an unconstrained dual problem uh, that is smooth and that is also uh, concave in both variables. So we went from a hard problem of um, a constrained minimization over uh, couplings to a, an easier maximization problem um, over here, the space of um, continuous function, but it is unconstrained. Um, and that is simply penalizing the, the previous constraints from the standard um, dual of And when you look at this, uh, at this dual problem, you can see that you can, um, so an intuitive thing to do would be to fix u and optimize over v and um, alternate fix v and maximize over u, or the opposite, I got confused. Um, and so that's what we call synchronous algorithm. So you alternate between fixing one, one, one variable and optimizing over the other, and you, um, you iterate until you reach some sort of convergence. And uh, if you consider a discrete problem, um, so if you discretize your problem or you're dealing with discrete measures, um, you can write this uh, iterative procedure very simply just as a vector matrix multiplications. Um, so your, um, your cost function is going to be encoded here in this matrix uh, K with um, also the regularization strength epsilon. And then your variables 
uh, u and v are going to be uh, written as um, exponentials. And then if you do this little trick, then you can write the optimality conditions for both u and v uh, as, as these uh, simple uh, iterations that only require, um, so the main computational cost of these iterations is to do um, this matrix vector multiplication here. All right, so if you, um, if you have two discrete measures of size, um, of size n, then a is going to be an n-dimensional vector, b is going to be an n-dimensional vector, and the matrix here, um, k, is going to be an n by n matrix. Um, and so the, the complexity of each iteration of the algorithm is going to be n squared. Uh, of course, the question is how many iterations do you need to do for this um, iterative procedure to converge? Um, and unsurprisingly, the, the number of iterations that you need to do is going to um, get prohibitive when epsilon goes to zero. So when you try to recover something that is close to the true optimal transport problem, you're going to have to do a lot more iterations. And so you synchronous algorithm doesn't get um, very competitive in terms of computational time. Um, so of course, there are, uh, and that's not the topic of this talk, so there are a way to accelerate synchron or to um, code it in a smarter way so that it's more efficient. But still, when you try to get epsilon to get, to get close to zero, it's uh, not really competitive anymore. Um, a nice byproduct of these uh, synchronous iterations that I'm uh, going to mention quickly is that it's, um, it gives you a differentiable approximation of optimal transport. Um, because synchron is essentially a, a sequence of matrix vector multiplications. And so it's something that is fully differentiable. And you can just um, write your synchronous iterations in your favorite um, um, library like TensorFlow or PyTorch. And then um, it gives you an approximation of optimal transport that you can differentiate through. Um, and it allows you to use it in some um, various, various applications. So for instance, you can, um, you can get differentiable sorting out of it because uh, optimal transport in one dimension is essentially sorting, so you can just do uh, synchron in one dimension, it will give you a uh, differentiable sorting. You can also use it to get uh, differentiable assignments uh, because optimal transport gives you this uh, um, coupling matrix that then becomes uh, differentiable when you compute it with synchron. Um, this allows you to do differentiable clustering, um, which is essentially the same as uh, differentiable assignments. And you can also then use this um, regularized loss um, as a loss for your uh, favorite machine learning problem. That's uh, something that I will uh, get back to later in the talk. So that's uh, that deals with the computational um, burden of optimal transport. We can see that entropy regularization uh, allows us to have a faster algorithm to compute a good approximation of optimal transport. Uh, but then we're still left with the robustness problem. Um, which, which tells us that transport is um, hard to estimate from samples, and it's not robust to, to sampling. And for that, the notion that we're exploring is sample complexity. And intuitively, the sample complexity tells you, um, it gives you the convergence rate of the uh, empirical uh, distance to the true distance between the measures. Um, and so for optimal transport, we know that if we look at the empirical, um, at the transport, at optimal transport computed on the empirical measures alpha and beta, um, it converges at, at the rates um, n to the minus one over d to the true um, optimal transport distance. And so we have a curse of dimension because if we want to reach some precision eta, for instance, when the dimension increases, the number of samples that we need is going to increase exponentially with the dimension. Um, so it's fairly inconvenient to, to use optimal transport in, in high dimensional settings. As for MMD, um, we have this uh, very nice rate, one over square root of n, so it's independent of dimension. The question um, that we asked ourselves, and that was a, a big part of my thesis, was um, what happens for regularized optimal transport? Can you, um, get be can you do better than uh, standard transport when you regularize? And the answer is yes. Um, if you look at the um, sample complexity of regularized optimal transport, you can see that you have kind of a, an interpolating behavior between that of optimal transport and that of MMD. Um, so when epsilon is, uh, goes to zero, so when you're um, close to the true optimal transport, you have something that is one over square root of n, but with this very bad constant here that degrades when epsilon goes to zero, and that's, uh, that also um, scales exponentially with the dimension. 
When epsilon goes to infinity, on the other hand, you have something that is independent of dimension. You get the same rate as an MD, which is uh, 1 over square root of n. And so this tells you that when you have large enough regularization, you can break the curse of dimension. Um, and so that regularizing is not just a way to have better, uh, like faster algorithm, but it's also a way to have a more robust notion of distance uh, when you're working on, on learning problems. Okay, so now we're happy because we have like a fast and robust distance, but when we want to use it for our um, earlier problem of quantization, um, it doesn't look so good. Um, we were expecting to recover the, the orange point cloud, but what happens is that the points get kind of all uh, um, clustered at the center of this uh, uh, orange point cloud. And uh, actually, this is the effect of entropy. And uh, this, um, this depends, this, this effect um, gets even worse when we increase the regularization parameter. So you can see that when epsilon is small enough, it, it looks okay. It's a good enough approximation. Um, but the more epsilon grows, the, the, worse, the, um, the worse this effect gets. And in the, in the worst case, it just uh, shrinks to one, like all the points shrink to one position uh, at the middle of the point cloud. Um, and so there's an explanation for this, and this is uh, this was a, a paper by Philippe Rigolet and, and John Weed, who are also at, at MIT. And what they tell us is that actually um, entropic transport is doing um, a Gaussian deconvolution. Um, so if you consider a noisy sample x1 xn that was generated according to some model alpha theta with the addition of a Gaussian noise with variance epsilon then the ma maximum likelihood for this uh, estimate for this model uh, alpha theta is the same as the parameter that minimizes the regularized Wasserstein distance between that model and your uh, noisy data so if it's maybe easier to understand on a, here um, visually on these uh, images but what it's um, what the regularized Wasserstein distance is doing is assuming that you um, that if you have some regularization level epsilon here, you actually, um, you're actually your data here in, in orange um, was corrupted by a noise of variance epsilon. So you can see that here epsilon is small, so it assumes that the orange data um, was only corrupted by a small amount of noise. And so that's why it's pretty much uh, still covering the whole point cloud. But here, when you increase your regularization, you assume that your orange data was subject to a lot of noise. And so the uh, regularized um, distance is trying to cancel out the noise. And that's why it's clustering to the middle. And when you get to very large um, regularization, it assumes that pretty much everything is noise. And so it's just um, estimating the, the mean. A uh, question? Mm -hmm. So I think uh, that's a, you're giving a good intuition for for this result, uh, maybe let me reinterpret the question. So you're saying that it's deconvolving the data with the Gaussian. It's assuming you added noise to the data. Mm -hmm. So if I took the blue dots and added random Gaussian noise with parameter epsilon, would it look more like the yellow dots? Yeah, exactly. And that's something that I um, that I plotted yesterday and forgot to add to my slides. Okay. <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah, actually, it's a uh, it's it really uh, so of course it's assuming that it's a Gaussian so here it's just going to do like a blue blob um, like it is a isotropic but right. it's still, uh, going to pretty much like cover the, the whole thing and here it would look pretty nice like just drawing little Gaussians around it um, so maybe yeah. that's the, the solution you really want is that what you're suggesting that so in, in a way yes um, so I, I guess there's there are two ways to there are several ways to interpret this problem so one thing is like if you know that your data is noisy then it's good to have some regularization um, that corresponds to the amount of noise that you think is in your data it's a like natural way to um, denoise your data set but of course in practice um, you want to be able to use larger v values of epsilon because you want to to have a fast uh, synchron algorithm. And so the larger epsilon, the faster synchron is going to be. Um, so you want to be able to use these values. And um, it's true that you could um, try to deconvolve that way. Um, but I'm going to introduce uh, another um, solution that we found to this, um, um, another solution that we found to this shrinking uh, issue of the, of the entropy. Jose, does that uh, help your, with your question? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Sorry? Great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. 
Okay, and so the, the alternative that we propose is what we call synchron divergences, and it's actually a class of distance that's going to interpolate between optimal transport and, and MMT. Um, and the idea comes from the very uh, naive observation that when you look at the regularized um, Wasserstein distance between alpha and itself, because of this added entropic term, you don't have something that is equal to zero. And our uh, idea was just to introduce corrective terms to debias in a way this uh, regularized Wasserstein distance and make sure that we get something that is equal to zero uh, when both measures are, are equal. Um, and so what we call synchron divergences here um, are just standard regularized Wasserstein distance minus these two terms, um, which are like uh, autocorrelation terms or whatever you want to call them, but um, that represent the, that are supposed to cancel out the um, additional um, entropy bias. And it's easy to see that when you take alpha equals beta, you have um, something that is equal to, to zero. And actually, um, I have um, colleagues, uh, so Jean Fedi and, and co-authors from ENS recently proved that uh, if you add these two terms, or if you subtract these two terms, you actually get something that is positive definite. So it's stronger than just um, it's equal to zero um, when alpha equals beta, it's equal to, it means it's equal to zero if and only if alpha equals beta. So it's, uh, it's a, this kind of naive idea is actually uh, um, pretty uh, powerful as it gives you something that is positive definite in the end. Um, and a nice uh, byproduct is that it's interpolating between optimal transports uh, when epsilon goes to zero and maximum mean discrepancies when epsilon goes to infinity. So it's um, easy to see that it's going to converge to optimal transport when epsilon goes to zero because this term converges to optimal transport between alpha and beta. This term converges to optimal transport between alpha and itself, which is zero and same here, it's going to be zero. Um, but then it's a bit more surprising to see that um, when epsilon goes to infinity, you recover the MMD. Uh, and the MMD for a specific kernel function here, which is going to be minus the cost that you use for uh, your optimal transport problem. Um, of course, for this thing to be an actual MMD, you need to ensure that minus your cost function um, is a um, positive definite function. So it's a valid kernel for MMD. Um, and it is the case when you take the cost function to be some power of the Euclidean distance um, with a power of P strictly smaller than two, and that's uh, called in the literature the energy distance. And so that's, um, you can see in the introduction, uh, that I, uh, I showed you what happens when you use MMD for a Gaussian kernel, which was pretty bad, and MMD for the energy distance that works uh, fairly well, and it's actually the limits of our uh, synchron divergence. Uh, another quick question. So mm -hmm. the, the, that's cool. You add those two terms to make it positive definite. Are the second two terms, are they something you need to compute, or is it just algebraically something you can work out? No, so sadly, it's not um, the, the regularized Wasserstein distance between the measure and itself doesn't have any closed form, so you um, you need to run the synchron algorithm again. Okay. Uh, it usually converges faster when the um, measures are close to one another, so it doesn't have too much computational overhead, but you still need to run the, the synchron algorithm here um, to to get these That's two. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so here's a reminder of what the gradient descent looks like for the energy distance. So this is for a power of p equals to one. So you have these points lagging behind. Um, so I told you, you can only use it for p strictly smaller than two. Um, here's what happens when p equals two. You can see it doesn't work at all. So it's really a, a degenerate case, um, which is a bit surprising because when you use the Wasserstein distance, the exponent um, p equals two, um, the two which corresponds to the two Wasserstein distance, um, is very well studied and beha behaves really nicely. Um, for the energy distance, it's not the case, it's an exponent that degenerates. Um, so it suggests that maybe you should you be sticking to the power one even when you use uh, the synchron divergence because in the limits, you don't want to have something that, that is at risk of degenerating like that. Um, right, and here's the gradient descent for the synchron divergence with epsilon equal to one. And you can see that the gradients are very efficient, um, similarly to, to optimal transport, but with a um, much smaller computational cost. Right, and here what happens in the more um, complex problem. So even the trajectories um, are interpolating between optimal transport and MMD. So if you recall that example that I showed um, in the introduction when I was comparing both distances, 
um, optimal transport was matching the blue points and the, the orange points in the straight line. And MMD was uh, shooting points all over the place and then really ha having trouble getting the blue points back in place. And here you can see that the synchron divergence does kind of a mix between the both. Um, so it's still sending points a bit all over the place, but then they're not shooting too far and then they're coming pretty fast to um, where those, they're uh, supposed to go. So we still uh, benefit from the good geometric properties of optimal transport, but with a more, um, with a friendlier uh, computational cost. Okay, so here's just a, a quick summary of uh, the different behaviors of the dist distances that I introduced. So uh, here is regularized optimal transport. So we have this shrinking issue. Here is the debiasing uh, synchron divergences with the same uh, regularization level here, epsilon equals one. You can see that you um, don't have the, that problem, um, that shrinking problem anymore. Um, however, if you uh, increase the regularization too much, so if you increase the regularization, um, synchron is going to go a bit faster, so you win a little bit on the computational um, aspect. But then you start to have this um, problem that the points, some points are lagging behind, uh, which is what happens in the limit when you uh, recover the energy distance. So I guess there's, um, you have to find the, the sweet spot here that corresponds to a regularization big enough so that you have fast algorithms, but not too big so that you still have um, strong gradients. Okay, and I'm going to uh, finish with uh, an application of this uh, of these synchron divergences um, to the inference of generative models, um, which were very popular uh, a few years back, and I, I guess um, still are. Um, so I'm just I'm pretty sure most of you know what these are, but just um, to fix some notations, I guess I'll reintroduce them. Um, so generative models are models for which you have some latent distribution here is zeta in a usually low dimensional space uh, Z. And your model alpha zeta is going to be defined as the push forward of that uh, latent distribution through some um, parametric function G theta, which is often taken to be a neural network, but can be anything. Um, and this gives you some, some model alpha theta uh, in a higher dimensional space X. And the goal of these generative models is to learn the parameter theta um, that is going to best reflect uh, the geometry of your, of your data set that has some unknown uh, distribution. So what is um, like the, the main um, feature of generative models, and that's probably why, why they're called that way, is that they're um, easy to generate data from. So it's, um, if you want to generate a sample x from your uh, generative model of a theta, First, you need to draw a sample from your latent distribution zeta, and then you just need to um, take x equal g theta of, uh, of z. That's what the push forward uh, notation here means. It's just that uh, to get a sample from uh, alpha theta, you take a sample from zeta and then apply the short function g theta to that point. Um, and so the, the idea is to use uh, synchron divergences to do inference on these types of models um, because of the way they're uh, formulated, you don't have access to the density, so you can't compute the likelihood and uh, do maximum likelihood estimation, which is um, customary in statistics. So you have to, uh, to solve it in some alternate way. And what we propose here is to minimize the synchron divergence between, um, um, between the model and the, and the data. And of course, so this is, um, this is the unknown distribution of the data. So you only access it through samples, uh, through your data sets. And this is the generative model from which you can um, sample, but you don't have access to its density either. Um, and so the optimization procedure is uh, uh, fairly standard. So we are going to solve this by gradient descent. And at each step of the uh, gradient descent, we approximate the synchron divergence here by uh, taking mini batches of these measures. Um, and then you're running a fixed number of synchron iterations to compute um, the distance. And once we have that approximation of the synchron divergence, we can compute the gradient using uh, backpropagation, and then we do a gradient, um, a gradient step in that direction. Um, here's what it looks like um, in a more schematic way with a, a free French lesson. So you have your um, data here. Um, and you take uh, um, a mini batch of the data, you have your generative model, um, you sample from it by first taking a sample from the latent distribution, uh, pushing it through your um, neural network, and then you obtain a sample according to your model distribution. You combine um, the, 
um, batches from the model and from the data in uh, cost matrix C that represents the pairwise distances between points uh, in both um, data sets. And then uh, you apply these vector matrix multiplications um, that correspond to the synchronous steps and you do a fixed number of uh, iterations. And this gives you um, entropy regularized optimal transport. And then you just do this uh, three times to get your synchron divergence. Um, and this whole procedure is just um, simple operations and um, mostly um, yeah, simple algebraic operations. And so you can just backpropagate through this uh, little scheme here to get the gradient of the synchron divergence with respect to the parameter uh, theta. Um, now I'm going to conclude with a, a couple of numerical experiments. Um, so here's a toy example of fitting uh, a 3D ellipse. Um, so the latent distribution in this case would be the uniform over a unit ball in R3. So here the latent space and the data space are both R3. Um, and the push forward function d theta is uh, AZ plus uh, omega. So if you take a point here uh, um, in, uh, in the unit ball, you apply um, the covariance matrix A plus some uh, um, offset term and you uh, get points in your, in your um, ellipse here. And so we want to infer the covariance of the ellipse and uh, its uh, center omega. So that's a very simple uh, generative model that you can visualize um, in 3D, but just to give a proof of concept. Um, and so here's what happens uh, when we learn the parameters using regularized optimal transport. Um, you see that we still have this uh, shrinking problem. You can see a, a thin um, green line here that goes through the middle of your data. Um, whereas when you use synchron divergences, you recover an ellipse that um, covers your, your data pretty well. And here's just a comparison of the energy distance and synchron divergence uh, with best parameters. Um, you can see that when you look at the ground truth for the covariance matrix in the centers, you get something that's much better with uh, synchron divergences than the energy distance. Um, and once we have this proof of concept in for, for low dimensional problems, we can uh, move to more complex problem and uh, the main uh, application of generative models is generating images and in the case of images it's not as clear um, what notion of cost we use um, because when we use optimal transport we need to define some notion of cost to move um, mass and in the case uh, here in, in 3D we are just using the Euclidean cost it's pretty um, intuitive but when we're dealing with images it's not really cl clear what notion of distance we put between images um, so the idea, um, which is very linked to the whole GAN literature, is to learn the cost function in an adversarial way. So we parameterize the cost function um, in this way with some neural network phi, and we look for an embedding and then look at the Euclidean distance in that embedding. Um, and the idea is that we want a cost that gives high values to the synchron divergence when uh, alpha is different from beta so that we can uh, discriminate between the samples from the model and the samples from the real data. And so the optimization problem uh, in this case becomes a min-max. So we are still minimizing over the parameters of the model alpha, but we're also now um, maximizing over the parameters of the cost function phi. And so this gives a, a GAN-type prob GAN problem and we alternate between uh, minimizing and maximizing. Um, it's, it's a training that's fairly uh, standard in, in the GAN literature. Um, and this gives um, some results. So here are some results in the C4 uh, 10 data set. Um, so comparison. So as often for generative models, you can you just see images and it's pretty hard to evaluate which, um, which is better. So um, here's a, a metric that's used fairly often uh, called the inception score. Um, and you can see that if you use, um, so higher is better. And if you use high regularizations, uh, you get something that performs better than the Gaussian MMD, which was a, um, State of the art again two years ago. So in in GAN time, it's uh, ages ago, um, but at the time it was uh, doing better than um, than uh, the MM, than MMD GANs. Um, and so there has been a follow up on optimal transport and, and GANs, not from myself, but from uh, people at OpenAI, um, who obtained a very good um, uh, numerical results with uh, with the same notion of distance between uh, um, on their on their GANs. Okay, so I'm just going to um, wrap up the talk by uh, recalling the main uh, um, takeaways. Um, so 
my, my goal was to convince you that synchronous divergences are a great notion of distance between measures um, and that you should use them in um, your favorite learning problems. Um, so intuitively, there are a way to debias rigorized Wasserstein distance. They allow to interpolate between optimal transport for small epsilon and MMD for large epsilon. And you still get the best of both worlds. You can inherit from the good geometric properties of OT. Um, but you can break the curve of dimension to epsilon large enough, so you get a you still get a reasonable sample complexity. And more, most importantly, um, you can leverage fast algorithms to implement it in uh, a variety of uh, machine learning tasks. Um, well, thank you for your uh, attention. I'll be happy to answer any questions.